Psalms 119, verses 65 to 72. Kate, the ninth letter I believe we're up to. This one is pricelessness. Pricelessness. The Word of God, is, what can you compare to it? Uh, you hold in your hands. Now think about this. In John 1.1 1, 1 it says that the, the Word became flesh. The Word is God. The Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. You hold something complete in your hands that even Jesus Christ didn't have on this earth. Paul didn't have it because he was writing it. Moses and all of them didn't have a complete Bible. And you hold a Bible that's complete in your hands that even the Jewish people don't have it complete. They don't believe the New Testament. They don't follow it. It's pricelessness. It's something that Jesus said is going to survive even when all this stuff is gone. Thou hast dwelt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. So everything that God says that he will do, he will do. Now it says dwelt well. What you've done, what God wanted you to do, God will take care of you. And that's well, that's great. This 65 to 72, there's a lot of contrast. Is it well when you don't do what God tells you to do? Is it well according to the rebellion that you have against God? And that too is according unto the word that what will happen to you when you decide to not do well and not be a servant of God. You can't call yourself a servant of the Lord if you don't do what the Lord tells you to do. So this verse is telling you, listen, a servant, I am obeying what you're telling me to do, Lord. And it is well according to your word, what you said. The blessings I will get by obeying God. And he's not pleased with just that statement. Because he says, now teach me good judgment. And knowledge I am not content for you God doing well in my life I want you to do better and I know for me to do better before you I have to be taught good judgment and knowledge of the Word of God and there are people out there who say judge not least you be judged this book gives me the right to judge things. Listen, you may take it, oh, you're judging me. I ain't judging you. I may be judging something in your life that you are doing. I could say gambling. And for some of you who are listening cares I don't do that or I may say something calling up your boss and giving him a lie so you get the night off but some of you oh judge not least you be no see I didn't mention you by name in order to do over well for God you got to ask God, even even though this is a new Old Testament and we are in a New Testament, you can ask God for good judgment. What is good judgment? What is this? You're in a street ministry. You're on a street corner, and there is someone who is who, who, you look at him and definitely involved in sin. Do I point out that sin? Oh, the evils of that beer in your hand. The evils of that cigarette in your mouth. Oh, that mini skirt. Oh, the bikini. Oh, the witness. What would be good judgment? The good judgment would be to preach that Christ died for them and not to sin. Good judgment would be if somebody comes up to you and they want money. 
What is good judgment? The fact is, when you come to an intersection, even though there's a crosswalk there, the best good judgment is look both ways before you dart out in the street. Now, I had last night, I had to return home. Kind of silly little man. I'm coming home. I don't know how many miles it is from work to here. But, 20 minute drive. You know, I almost hit three people. During the speed limit, between 25 and 35 miles per hour, I almost hit three people in a crosswalk. Because of their clothes, dark. And they just walk right on out. And doesn't. That's not good judgment. See, good judgment will give you longer life. And you've got to be taught by God, do not let Satan in the world teach you good judgment. Because their good is not God's good. See, to the world, good judgment is wear a condom. God's good judgment is wear a ring. That's good judgment. Good judgment of God is read his book. What would the world be? Read anything else but... And knowledge. Knowledge of what? God. Knowledge of the word. Knowledge of sin. Knowledge of what God wants you to do. Knowledge of what God doesn't want you to do. You get Genesis to Revelation in your life. And your reading of Genesis to Revelation is not going to match my reading for my life. Because we are different people. I may read one story and, and, and get an insight of something that has happened in my life or is going on now or will happen that God will show me that you will not get that. I've gotten knowledge in the Word of God by things that happened in my life that's never happened to you. I came to a near drowning. A lot of you out there have never come to that. I've had things in my life that relate to stories in the Bible. There are things in the Bible that you read, and when you come to it, it hits, it hits you personally. And I can just read right over, like, what was all that about? But to you, it might be something big in your life. And to me, it'd be like, all right, I'll just read it. To have God do well to you, is that you're a servant. Don't be content there. Go even further. Go for the good. Go for the judgment. Go for the knowledge. But I'm going to warn you. All they that live godly shall suffer persecution. And there will be more put to you as far as judgment will come. The more you know about God, the more you know about his word, the more you're going to face at the judgment seat of Christ. Not everybody who is saved can handle a Jehovah Witness. But if God's giving you the ability and the knowledge of Scripture that you can... All right, you're going to be judged upon what you did and what you didn't do. A good judgment and knowledge would be a young man and his life as a young man. What God, what God expects from him. As that with a young lady. To keep herself pure. The Bible speaks much about women in their dress. He even goes far to say that a woman not even talk in church. She's not to assert the authority over a man. And that's ooh and evil today. A young man is addressed by the Bible to go get a job and work. And trained to be a man in battles like Joshua. 
and that young man were to get married, he's to ask God on judgment and knowledge on who to marry. As to with the young lady, who she's to marry. And then you go branching off there all the knowledge and, and judgment that you need to know from God on our family and marriage. I can go all night with that. I have believed thy commandments. You got to believe who God is, Hebrew says. 11. And you can't be a hypocrite. I believe the Bible says that thou shalt not have a false witness, and then you stand up in line. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Pain is an attention getter. Sorrow is, hey, wake up. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I astrayed myself. I left before the affliction. Which means God will send affliction to you if you go astray. Now, is that the case all the time? No. Listen, you can have a headache because... Uh, you're sitting in a restaurant having a hamburger and three busloads of kindergarten kids came in also now. You got the headache because of all the kids right and all that. That's not because you're going straight because you're having a burger at a hamburger joint. I'm I've got a rash now. The rash is, it may not be afflicted by God. Looks like one of the medicines I'm taking is causing it. Yeah, but look at Job. Wouldn't you say boils and all that was a nice little rash that God placed upon him through, de through Satan to get Job's attention? And it finishes, but now have I kept thy word. See, I was, a, I was astray. God sent affliction. Now I'm in the word. What are you to do when you backslide and come back? What are you to do when you repent? What are you to do when you're lost and now you get saved and you're born again? You're a new Christian. You are to now keep thy word. God's word. That's why when you get a new convent, the very first thing is put a King James Bible in his hand and tell him to read it. Thou art good. There is none good that doeth. Jesus said to the rich young man, Why calls me good? There is none good but God. He said, Good. To me, good is a little word. It don't mean better or the best. I would say, Thou art the bestest. To me, the bestest is the best of all the best. But when you look at the verse, that there is none good. Well, who's in the classification now? If there is none good, that rules out all men in verse 68. And if that verse says there is none good, and that rules out verse 68, thou art good, that just leaves God alone. For there is none good, you, don't, you can't even put a name there but God. Now, if God is good on that right there, what about the Almighty God? The one that is the creator, the one that made everything. I mean, if you were to put down a piece of paper from trees to atoms, and yet there is no comparison for good because there is nothing good.
Yeah, but Adam before his fallen state was good too. So Adam was liking to God. He was made in the image of God. He was without sin. And God had a daily fellowship walk with him. I don't know. Would God in glory just come up and start talking to one of the angels? They said it was a cool day in the garden that God came and they heard his voice. And they hid. Thou art good and doest good. Now, a lot of people in the world don't believe that verse, or at least that part. Why would he cause the twin tornadoes? Why would he cause famine? Why would little babies die? Yeah, but we're not good. And God is good, and God is holy, and God is right. Do I have an answer for all that? No, I don't. Teach me thy statutes. Okay. 68 is a mouthful. For 10 words, it's a mouthful. And you miss it. We just, okay, I'm done reading. There's my three chapters. Thou art good, and that's God only. No man. For none are good, okay? There is none good. Only God. And doeth good. And Jesus said again, for God is the only one that's good. Teach me thy statutes. The only one that could teach you God's statutes is God himself. So when Jesus comes along and believes John 14, he says the one that teaches is the Holy Spirit. It's not your preacher. It's not your Sunday school teacher. It's not the guy in the street. It's not... It's the Holy Spirit leading them through the Holy Spirit, God's Word, that you're being taught. God is only using the men as instruments, as vessels, and your own reading. The Holy Spirit can teach you as you read your own Bible in your own time and study. The Bible says study to show thyself. That's talking to you. That's not just talking to a preacher. So, for a common person who's not in the ministry, well, let's we'll see what let's we'll see what this commentator says. Let's see what Billy Graham says. Let's see what John R. R. No, I don't care if you got a a Bible book written by your father or your husband. No, because for all have sinned. There is none good. Seek God to help you read your Bible and show you things. And only after you prayed about it and sought God, then go to the commentaries. Go to another book if you still under, uh, don't understand. And worse all, take your, take your pen or your pencil and then put a little question mark there. And you don't understand, maybe the Lord will, will give you the answer later, maybe not. But we run to men right away for the answers, and man's not good enough. For only God is good for the answers. The proud have forged a lie against me. Well, that's not good. So pride will bring lies. They don't want to humble themselves to say the truth. You know why when you're caught doing something, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is a lie? Because you, you're proud enough. you got enough pride to say, I'm not going to shame myself to, sit, to tell the truth and take the consequences. Now the proud has lied against me, but I... Will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. There's the whole heart again. Study the whole heart of this chapter. The contrast is, hey, I'm not prideful. I don't have pride. And I'm not going to lie. Do you know it is capable, it is 
within warrant. It is your limitation that you are able to never to tell a lie if you're a Christian. You don't have to lie. And I know you don't have to be prideful. Because pride and lies are not attributes of God. The Bible says he is the children of all. He is a king of over the children of pride. Read John 8, 44. About the liar. That's Satan. In verse 69, you got the characteristics of Satan. And you got the, the characteristics of a man of God who's trying to do right. See, Satan, pride and lies, the Christian, the Word of God. That's it. The Word of God says, I am not to be proudful. I am not to be, have pride. And the Word of God says, I'm not to lie. I just, it just said, I love, or I have, uh, I believe thy commandments. I'm not to bear false witness. whole heart all of it you give God your whole heart and then you can work wonders he said if you had if you had faith in the grain of a mustard seed but we don't then we give in to Satan and so their heart my whole heart, but their heart, the liars and the pride, is as fat as grease. So we put a big name on it so we can charge more money called cholesterol. Bible's archaic. It's old and all fat. There's cholesterol in the Bible. Psalm 119, the whole ver the whole chapter, the longest chapter in the Bible is about the Word of God, and you got cholesterol there. The hardening of the heart. And that's the subject of this, this verse here. The unhealthy heart. Their heart is hard, is what he's saying. My whole heart, I delight in thy law. When I read the word, when I do the word, I'm putting my whole heart into it. They don't. They are hardened against the word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. And that goes back to verse 67. Can you say that? What is Paul's remark to this verse here? It is good I have been afflicted. Rejoice evermore. In everything you give thanksgiving. That's a hard saying. But if the whole heart is given to God and whatever you've gone through, you can say that. Fox's Book of Martyrs proves the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace proves Daniel afflicted even though he did not sin. The Hebrew children did not sin. And affliction came. Yet David, when confronted by Nathan about his sin, his life was afflicted, but he was a changed man afterwards. I guarantee he guarded his eyes because it cost four of his children. His sin ruined his boys. 
He had one boy sleep with his own sister as a rape. Well, David didn't do nothing about it. How could he? Imagine him pointing his finger in Amon's face and Amon pointing his finger back. Uh, what about Bathsheba over there? You know what David learned? He learned Galatians 6, 7, even though it wasn't written. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. So it is good that I have been afflicted means I've learned a lesson. I have learned from the errors of my way. And it's also a tension getter, as I said, that I may learn thy statutes. I better get back in this word. I better ask God for judgment and knowledge so I don't do it again. So in other words, I'm going to read my Bible for one for one purpose of many. In other words, I want to know about God. Well, I don't know where the number is on numbering down a sheet of paper, but, but there'd be another reason why I read from Genesis to Revelation. Because I don't want God to get the rod out and kick my butt. Because chastisement hurts. And it also hurts my Father in Heaven. So if I keep my nose in the book like I'm supposed to and do what God's supposed to, what God suspects me to do or wants me to do, if I do what God wants me to do, there will be no hurt feelings of my behind and there will be no hurt feelings of God who has to whip me because I'm doing right. And that when I do do wrong, and I am put down over God's knee, and God spanks me and chastises me because I am his son, and he is my father, I am to take that lesson and say, Hey, I need to read the Bible more clearly about sins. I need good judgment and knowledge of who I am, verse 66. I'm going to say this, I've said this, I don't know how many years I've said this. You need to get off by yourself when you're alone with God and say, God, what is breaking the fellowship between you and me? What unconfessed sins are in my life? What sins are in my life right now, though confessed, are still there and are hampering you using me as a clean vessel? And too many Christians will not do that because they enjoy their sin. And it would be better if God just shut his mouth about it and leave them alone. And they don't realize affliction will come. You may not get lung cancer. <laughs> I, got, I didn't get lung cancer. I, I beat the Surgeon General. And you watch all those pack of cigarettes or those cigars or those or that chewing tobacco. You watch all that just go up and smoke in the judgment seat of Christ. Wasted time, wasted money, and the harm that you did to God's body that he purchased your body. Your body is not your own. It is purchased by God. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And sometimes your sin will, will bring a lighter, more relevant of the Bible being read. There are sins in your life that when you read the Bible, there it is. And then there are sins in the Bible mentioned you've never done. You know what I like, Peter? Peter stood in the face of God and rebuked God. And how many times do we do that a day and we don't see the face of Jesus Christ, but we do. We're, we're seen in heavenly places. Oh, no, God can't do that. <laughs> Peter had enough nerve to do it to God's face. <laughs> Yeah.
You know what Peter learned? He had to shut his mouth. Sometimes your mouth gets you in trouble. There was one time Peter said, "Oh no, 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 Lord, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forsake you." And it said, "I forget what you, I think it's Matthew says, and the disciples said so too." Peter egged on the disciples. After Jesus said, "You're all going to forsake me. One of you is going to, one of you is going to betray me, and then all the rest of you eleven are going to forsake me." Oh no, not me, Lord! And another disciple, "Yeah, not us." And what happened when Jesus was betrayed in the garden? Poof, they're all gone. Peter made them all liars. You gotta be careful what you say with your mouth, especially around other Christians. You got to learn thy statutes, study to show thyself approved unto God, going to hear your, your preacher preach, your own studying, your own reading. The law of thy mouth, God's mouth, is better unto me. Then thousands of gold and silver. And that's where he gets the pricelessness. That one verse. Now I've, I've taken these titles that we've gone through. And I've used another man. Yeah, I'm guilty. But if you were to ask me a title of this, from 65 to 72, I would say the lesson of affliction by the word. Or something like that. Something affliction with the word. And there are some people who are afflicted who don't go to the word. And never will go to the word. And God will keep afflicting them until their death. And they'll never get right. So with an affliction as I close, affliction will keep, I mean, the word of God, excuse me, the word of God will keep you from affliction. Because you'll know what to do and what not to do. Now, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. That's not affliction, that's suffering. You're suffering for doing right. That's a good thing the Bible says. And when you do do wrong, and you rebel against God, and affliction comes, get right. Get right into the word and do not come out of it. And then after affliction is gone, or it may not go away, but after you've gotten that right fellowship back with God, seek God for judgment and knowledge and his ways to not do it again. And when you do it again, because we're, we're flesh, we're in the flesh, get right, get right back in the word, get right with God. And learn your lesson. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. And when I think 
that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me.